Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire, and Episode 31, Volga Bulgaria, Part 2. And before we begin, I'd like to thank my new boyars, Michael and Samuel, and State Councillor Victoria for their support. So, we've heard plenty about the highly structured organisation of steppe societies, and we know that the Bulgars and other peoples from the steppe who moved into the middle Volga to form Bulgaria were building cities and transitioning to a sedentary lifestyle. So you should have already guessed that we're dealing with a hierarchical, stratified society. As we've touched on before, like in Rus, it does not map onto the French or English model of feudalism with independent centres of power based on land holdings. But it is the kind of society that Russian, Soviet and Tatar historians call feudal, in the sense that this stratification and hierarchy exists even if it is in a somewhat different form from the old feudal pyramid that we saw in school. In this model, the steppe, comitatus based structure is regarded as pre-feudal, with Bulgar society transitioning to increasingly advanced feudalism from the rise of their cities in the 10th century through to the Mongol conquest. That, at least, is the Tata view. As historians Albert Nigamayev and Fayez Cousin write, quote, Russian historiography considers the social political order of pre Mongol Volga Bulgaria as something both complete and static. Scholars studying this subject base their theories solely on the rich resources of the 10th century. The structure of early 10th century Bulgar society described by Ibn Fadlan is applied with minor additions to the entire pre-Mongol history of the state. End quote. Really, it should be obvious at first glance that this approach is nonsense. We're talking about over three years of history, from here to the Mongols, in which a society transitions from steppe nomadism to sedentary agriculture, moves from mobile yurt type structures into cities of tens of thousands with the first brick-built structures in Eastern Europe, and converts from paganism to Islam, this could not have happened without changes in social structure and governance. What we have is the continuing influence of Russian imperialist attitudes. Volga Bulgaria must be downgraded, it must be treated as less developed, tribal, primitive, backward, in order to justify conquest and subjugation. But this was simply not true for early Bulgaria. As you might have picked up in the last episode, the emergence of Bulgaria was driven by very similar processes to the emergence of Rus. We've also discussed similarities between the cultures of the Rus specifically the Scandinavian-derived elite, and steppe cultures. We're going to see a great example of that in our next episode. At the level of the ordinary population, we've also already seen that the Slavs and the Saltiv cultures were living side by side in the Western steppe, in harmony as far as we know, and also had many similarities. The same Saltiv who moved en masse to Bulgaria to escape the Pechenegs. So we have two societies that have a lot of similarities, and at least in the early part of their history, the Bulgars are the more advanced. They have trade infrastructure and administration in place before the Rus, they are literate before the Rus, and they convert to a world religion tying them into a wider cultural heritage before the Rus do. In a few episodes' time, when we get to the conversion of Rus, the story that I'm sure many of you will have already heard of Vladimir choosing between Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, Islam is in that contest precisely because of the Rus' familiarity with the Bulgars and how impressed the Rus were with their cities and culture. So how did we lose this picture? Here. 
we have to blame the Mongol conquest. The Mongols devastated Bulgaria. We know there were Bulgar histories and Bulgar poets, because other people mention their works. But nothing survives. We have no Bulgar primary chronicle to work with. And because Volga Bulgaria was conquered by the Mongols and then by the Russians, we, until very recently, inherited only the imperial histories, where the only question to be answered was, why were they conquered? But none of that was inevitable. I know at least some of you will be familiar with the idea that the Mongols destroyed Rus and caused Moscow to rise to power, which is a theory that we will examine when we get to it. But we can also speculate that, without the Mongols, Bulgaria would have continued to develop into a strong Turkic state on the Volga, capable of maintaining its independence. An alternative history in which Russian expansion to the east is blocked, and the Russian Empire never appears. The mission statement of this podcast, to be the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire, means trying to tell those stories from the viewpoint of those peoples. But despite the importance of the Bulgars, we have lost that voice. So we are left with archaeology and second-hand reports, often from their enemies, or at least rivals. But anyway, back to our story. When Ibn Fadlan arrived in Volga, the king was a man named Almush, or Jafar ben Abdullah, who ruled from 903 to 931. His father, Abdullah ben Tegan, or Shilki, had ruled sometime in the late 9th century, and the dynasty had been established by Almush's grandfather, who may have been called Tegan. This family will rule in Volga Bulgaria until the Mongols arrive, but the line of succession jumps around a bit. Long-term listeners will be familiar with collateral succession, that is, succession by a brother or cousin, being as common in steppe cultures as direct lineal succession, maybe even more so. Almish had four sons, Memek Tay, Ahmed ben Jafar, Mikhail ben Jafar, and Hazan ben Jafar. Memekta died while Almish was still on the throne, and the third son, Mikhail ben Jafar, succeeded him as ruler. Mikhail was briefly succeeded by his son, also named Mikhail, and then the three sons of Ahmed ben Jafar took over. They were followed by the grandson of Almish's youngest son, Hazan ben Jafar, who was named Haidar. And with the exception of a grandson by his younger son, Ibrahim bin Muhammad, the line of Haidar's eldest son, Said bin Haidar, then ruled by direct succession until the Mongol conquest. The origin of the dynasty remains in dispute. Some scholars argue that the ruling family were actually Basils, specifically Basil nobles that had married wives from the Ashina clan which I hope you remember goes all the way back to the origins of the Turks. Shikhabuddin Marjani, a prominent figure in the 19th century revival of Tatar national consciousness who wrote the first histories of the Tatar people, fusing their traditional memories with European methodological approaches, believed that the Bulgar Eltebes came from the same Dulo clan as the Danube Bulgarian Khans. If you'll recall, a rivalry between the Ashina and the Dulo may have played a role in the original split of the Bulgars from the Western Turk. Others argue that both the Ashina and the Dulo were represented, as the Basils and the Suvars had never had any association with the Dulo, and therefore some Ashina presence would have been required to win their loyalty. It's also known that the Bulgars living on the Don were ruled by the Nushibi a family from the Ashina clan that was actively hostile to the duo. Naturally, the Bulgars had their own legendary origin story, and it's one you might not be expecting. 
The ruling dynasty of the Bulgars claimed as their founder Iskander Dulkoernin, Alexander the Great. This is maybe not as odd as it might seem on its face. Alexander is the subject of many legends in the lands he conquered, and appears in the Quran as the punisher of infidels and protector of the faithful for whom he builds cities. The social structure that I referred to as feudal a minute ago was not the same as the Frankish model or the Islamic model in the Caliphate or the Russian model. Developed out of the rapid sedentarization and expansion of agriculture in a people with steppe nomad origins and the resulting changes in the stratification of their society. The rulers of Volga Bulgaria taxed trade, as we've heard, which was nothing out of the ordinary. Taxes on trade were an important source of income for most pre modern rulers. They also claimed a share of any booty their subjects acquired in war or raids, especially slaves, which they then sold themselves. And there were some special taxes on events. If your son got married, you had to pay a tax. But according to Ibn Fadlan, so at least at the early stages of Bulgaria, they did not tax their subjects' own production. You could make pots and sell them, or grow wheat, and no taxes were owed. Unlike in Western Europe, again according to Ibn Fadlan, so at least in early Bulgaria, the state did not participate in justice. The king or his representatives did not judge disputes. Fines were not levied on offenders. Crimes were adjudicated by the representatives of the community based on customary practice. Rather than a system of obligations in which large landholders demanded rents from commoners and provided protection and justice in return, that was the theory anyway, commoners in Volga Bulgaria owed the state service obligations rather than financial ones. The ordinary people were free and could hold their own land, but they needed to do what the Khan wanted from time to time. An example that's often pointed to as early evidence of the emergence of this structure is a large system of fortifications built across the Transkarma region in the 10th century, which would have required a substantial expenditure of time and manpower. The late 10th century also saw extensive construction of fortified towns and outposts as settlements expanded to the north, northwest, and southwest, showing the state taking an active role in the colonization process. Increasing centralization can also be seen in moves to consolidate other groups, such as the rulers of Suva, under Bulgar control. Islamization also had an effect on Bulgar society. As in the West, where, for example, the Church attempted to impose Carolingian marriage rules throughout Christendom, the Caliphate advanced some rules they regarded as essential for Muslim societies. Ibn Fadlan comments on this regarding Bulgar inheritance customs, quote, If one of them dies before his sons, his brother takes over. I taught the king that this is forbidden and explained to him the correct rules of inheritance until he understood them. End quote. In the caliphate, the caliph was the ultimate owner of all the land. The tax, the kharaj, was paid by the land user to the state treasury. The most widespread form of land tenure was ikta which was land given for a period anywhere from short term to life and reward for service. This developed into a system of transferable land tenure called mulk that was subject to a tithe tax called usha. This system was spread into Central Asia after the Muslim conquest, with the ikta becoming hereditary within a couple of centuries. In the Turkic states that emerged within the territories that had been conquered by the caliphate, Land became state property, with taxes and service obligations imposed on the population for its use. Volga Bulgaria is an interesting case in that it converted to Islam voluntarily rather than as a result of conquest. Indeed, the caliphate 
was not initially particularly interested in converting its subject peoples. So Islamization among the Bulgars took place even before it did in much of Central Asia. William of Rubric noted that the Bulgars followed Islamic teachings more strictly than anyone else. So it is not surprising that a similar system to that in other Muslim territories would have applied in Bulgar. This meant the state owning the majority of the land and allocating it for use, both to communities for their support and to encourage the expansion of settlements into free or contested territory, and to the military and administrative service class as a reward for their work. Again, due to the Mongol destruction, we do not have surviving records of these allocations or taxes. But scholars believe that this is the case because we have the various writings of Muslim authors who visited Bulgaria or interviewed merchants travelling there. As we've already noted a few times, the tendency in the writings from this time was that they mentioned things that were different or unknown and ignored things that were familiar. So the fact that Ibn Fadlan or Abu Hamid al Ghanati, a scholar from Granada, who travelled throughout the Muslim world and visited Bulgaria twice, did not describe the system of land tenure in Bulgaria, makes it most probable that it resembled the Iqtar system that they expected to find in Muslim territory, and therefore didn't deserve comment. Scholars also believe that it's probable that this system would have transitioned towards hereditability in Bulgaria, most likely centred around those fortified towns and settlements they were building as they expanded their territory, with their military head of the district becoming the local lord. This view is supported by implication by the fact that Abu Hamid al Ghanati does mention the Bulgar Khan collecting the jizya, the Islamic tax on non-believers, which was demanded from all adult men of subject regions except the elderly, disabled, beggars, slaves, and those who were serving in the military. According to Abu Hamid al ghanati who was writing about 150 years later than Ibn Fadlan, the tax system that Ibn Fadlan described, where people kept all the fruits of their labours, had been replaced with the more standard Muslim system of the haraj rent paid for land and the usha tithe paid on profit. The usha was due from everyone who earned a profit, whether merchants, craftsmen or farmers, and was considered to include the mandatory tax on Muslims to assist those in need. The local lords who were appearing collected these taxes from the land that was under their control and were themselves then liable to pay taxes up to the Khan. Their profit was the difference between the levies they were able to collect and the amount they were forced to pay to the Khan. The ruler of Bulgaria, who Ibn Fadlan called Malik, or king, was initially a military leader, like those of a tribal confederation of steppe peoples. But if we circle back for a minute to the discussion of royal clans on the steppe, you'll recall that it was also common among the steppe peoples for the ruler to have a sacral function, sometimes even to the extent of having two rulers, one who only performed ritual functions and one who did the actual day-to-day -day ruling and military leadership. There is no sign of this phenomenon among the Bulgars, although it might be expected if the leader was indeed an Ashina, and historians don't seem to have any real idea why they were different. According to Ibn Fadlan, Almish was the supreme religious and secular authority, but he was also much more engaged with the people than, for example, the Khazar Khan. While the Khan could only be approached by a select few after fulfilling various ritual requirements, Almush could, says Ibn Fadlan, be approached by anyone, young or old. He rode his horse alone, without a guard. He personally greeted embassies and inspected merchant ships for customs duties. He had a council comprising four sub-kings, leaders of the other major tribes, plus members of the Bulgar ruling family. 
The descriptions given by Ibn Fadlan suggest that this council permanently operated with considerable executive power in military and diplomatic matters. The Kurultai, a kind of democratic institution functioning in steppe societies that we will discuss in more detail later, lost its power as the Bulgars transitioned away from the military being the main function of society to become more of a ceremonial meeting to express approval for the king's actions. A mass public meeting to decide crucial matters affecting everyone, known as a jin, could still be called on occasion, such as the one held by the Bulgars on 16th of May 922 to officially adopt Islam and one held in June 922, with all the tribes of Bulgaria, at which Almish announced the building of a new capital. The role of the Jin would gradually decline over the pre-Mongol period, as local and regional assemblies became more important than the tribe. And over the same period, the council of sub-kings and royal relatives would also be replaced by professional administrators headed by a vizier. Due to the lack of written records, it's difficult to reconstruct this process with any precision, something compounded by the variety of names used in different sources. Islamic writers called the rulers of Bulgaria and the four sub-kings Malik, which is usually rendered as king and was their standard term for a ruler, although Ibn Fadlin also threw in an occasional emir for variety. Emir was a title used in the Muslim world for rulers that acknowledged the supremacy of the caliph, which the Vulgars did not. The Rus called them Knyaz, which, as we know, usually gets rendered as prince, but should be king. The Bulgars used El Tabir until the end of the 10th century, which acknowledged their subordination to the Khazar Khan, although some scholars have argued that the term was actually Bilikfar a word meaning learned one or born marked. After the fall of Khazaria, El Tabir began to be used for the Bulgarian sub-king who commanded an army. The word Khan is often used to refer to the ruler of Bulgaria, but there's actually some academic debate over whether this title existed in pre-Mongol Bulgaria at all. Some historians believe it was only introduced to the Middle Volga during the Golden Horde period. Others counter-argue that Khan is a general term we find across Turkic-speaking groups from their first appearance in the Chinese records, and even among the Slavicized Bulgarians on the Danube, which makes it improbable that the Bulgars did not use it. All other medieval Turkic and Mongolic political entities used Khan, often rendered as Tsar in contemporary Russian writings, even where the ruler took the personal rather than state title of Sultan. In Turkic convention, the personal title came before the name and the state title after. For instance, the noted ruler of the Crimean Tatars styled himself the great Sultan Khakan Mengligirai Khan, Dedicated listeners may be wondering about the place of women in early Bulgaria and whether the greater egalitarianism of the steppe continued on in the sedentarized society. We have no way of knowing from the available materials whether this was the case or how gender relations in Bulgaria compared to the Rus or any of the other peoples around them. Ibn Fadlan does describe one of Almish's wives participating in official ceremonies, and some female titles like Katun, the wife of a Khan or Emir, Bike, wife of a Bek, Alti or Ilchi, roughly equivalent to a lady or mistress, have been recorded, which suggests that they did exercise some kind of authority. <laughs> Bilyar, the great city, stood on the Mali Cheremshan, or small Cheremshan, which flows into the Balshoi Cheremshan, or big Cheremshan, 
a tributary of the Volga that runs across modern-day Tatarstan and Ulyanovsk Oblast. The city of Bulga stood on the Volga, around 100 kilometers away, while Suva was around 75 kilometers away. The excavated ruins showed that it was an impressive city. It had concentric lines of fortifications with a total of almost 20 kilometers of walls, protecting a central citadel and residential areas, as well as suburbs outside the walls, reaching a total of over 800 hectares. It contained the earliest brick buildings in Eastern Europe and the first cathedral mosque, which had an internal space of 1,400 square meters. Excavations of the site showed that its initial development was very rapid, with the 600 hectares within the walls being built out during the city's initial formation. The concentric circular development was typical for cities built by sedentarizing steppe peoples. Attil is described as similar, and the early Bulgar settlements on the Danube, like Pliska and Preslav, also followed this form. The Cathedral Mosque, which was initially a wooden structure and then partially rebuilt in stone, served an administrative purpose rather than religious. The prayer for the ruler was read and royal announcements delivered. Significant cases were adjudicated there, and it also housed the state treasury. A large two-story brick building stood near the mosque and is believed to have been the residence of the clerical elite. The residential area between the citadel and the outer walls contains extensive traces of artisan workshops, especially blacksmiths, jewellers, furnaces, and other remains of metallurgical works, as well as ceramics production. The areas outside the walls also show signs of large herds of cattle and horses, which were probably moved around seasonally. Although the city rapidly occupied the territory, the population continued to grow throughout the pre-Mongol period, with clear signs of increasing density of construction. Around the city there are the remains of settlements that do not contain any trace of artisan production or agriculture. Archaeologists believe that these were camps for the people who were brought to the city to fulfill their service obligations by doing construction work. Rapidly building a city of this size with massive fortifications would certainly have required forced labour. Able-bodied workers would have been brought in whenever large-scale works were required, such as when the fortifications were strengthened and expanded in the 11th century. The pre-Mongol period saw increasing rivalry between Volgal Bulgaria and the Rus of Vladimir and Suzdal, so military preparedness and defences remained a priority and were enhanced as Bulgaria's wealth grew. Brick buildings increased in number in the 11th and 12th centuries, often two-storey, and the more impressive ones with central heating, with a furnace on the northern side sending hot air through underfloor conduits. If that sounds a bit like a hypercourse system, historians do think it was copied from similar Byzantine systems, which would have been familiar to the Bulgars from their time in the North Caucasus and Crimea. The ordinary people lived rather more simply, of course. According to writers, felt yurt-type structures remained in use even among people who did not practice mobile lifestyles. Timber and timber-framed wattle and daub houses were also common. Archaeological finds show that the typical house was square. Grain storage spaces were dug into the ground with a plank floor over the top, and tandoori-type ovens were built into one wall. They had gabled roofs. As you would expect in medieval times, the major cities had satellite fortresses and networks of villages that fed into the large markets of the towns. There's some evidence of regional specialization, such as chakma, which appears to have been based around iron production and blacksmithing. Other areas concentrated on herding, agriculture, fishing or hunting. To some extent this was determined by natural resources, but the development of fortresses and travel infrastructure indicates that there may also have been an element of central direction and planning. (music) 
As already mentioned, Almish was the ruler of the Bulgars who led the official adoption of Islam. So let's end today's episode with a look at what we know about that conversion. As in other cases of steppe peoples adopting major world religions, official conversion only took place once the religion had already become sufficiently widely followed. We do not know when Islam first began to be practiced among the Bulgars, but the evidence from graves shows that some influence was already present from the early stages of the migration to the Volga. The process is slow, most graves remain predominantly steppe-style burials for the next couple of centuries, but there is a gradual transition to Muslim burial practices. This is in all likelihood a lagging indicator. People are more willing to adopt, say, dietary practices than they are to abandon taboos around the dead and their funerary customs. In 922, Almish sent a mission to Caliph al-Muqtadir in Baghdad, asking that teachers be sent to teach his people the proper ways and laws of Islam. Several theories are advanced as to why. It could have been part of the Bulgars asserting their independence from the Khazars. It could maybe even have been intended as an expression of hostility towards the now Judaism-practicing Khazars or it could have been further intended to boost their highly profitable relations with the Caliphate and the rest of the Islamic world. Certainly after 300 years of domination of the Western Steppe, the age of the Khazars was approaching its end, and a number of interrelated processes were underway that could have affected their choice, from Khazar loss of control over the Pechenegs to Byzantine alliances with the Aarhus and other peoples to further destabilize the steppe, to rising Rus military power, to booming trade with the Islamic world. The conversion to Islam has most often been interpreted in the lies of the Bulgars seeking greater independence from the Khazars, but if that was their main motive, we should be able to see that the Khazars were in fact dominating them. And can we see that? Most likely not. Yes, the Bulgars paid tribute to the Khazars, and yes, Almish moaned about it to Ibn Fadlan, but the payment of tribute itself is not indicative of subjugation. It might just mean that it's easier to pay someone than to get into a conflict with them. The Romans and the Byzantines paid off various barbarians any number of times. Russia paid the Khan of the Crimean Tatars. This is not particularly unusual. If we look for evidence of Khazar interference in Bulgaria's domestic or foreign affairs, we just don't find any. They still controlled the Lower Volga, which made amical relations extremely important, but there's no sign that they actively projected force into the middle of Volga, and in contrast to the Don and Dnieper region, there were no Khazar fortresses or garrisons there. In the ruling family, the Khazar Khan, kept one of Alwish's sons as a hostage. But again, the exchange of noble hostages was common practice among allies as well as subjects. Alwish also sent a daughter to marry the Khan, who Ibn Fadlan notes had a wife from each of his subject kings. But when she died, Alwish quickly married his younger daughter off to one of his own sub-kings and told the Khan that he had no more daughters to send him. If you can cast your mind back to the episodes on the Khazars, you'll also remember that it seems likely that only the nobility actually converted to Judaism. We do not have any evidence of them trying to spread their new faith among their subjects, and certainly not among the Bulgars, although it would be natural for some to convert as a way to curry favour with their rulers. Steppe peoples had also traditionally been tolerant of various beliefs, so it seems unlikely that the Bulgars would have seen converting to Islam as striking a blow against their Khazar overlords. We should also not assume that there was any hostility between Muslim and Jewish believers in Khazaria or anywhere else on the Western Steppe. That would be anachronistic, and we have no evidence to support this being the case. 
Although it is often assumed that the fortress Almish asked the Arabs to help him build was for defending the Bulgars against the Khazars, quite reasonably, Ibn Fadlan actually wrote that it was directed against unspecified enemy kings, plural, and it could have simply been intended to protect the Bulgars and their trade routes against all comers. It was also almost two centuries since the Arab Khazar Wars, and the territories of the Caliphate had become the Khazars' main trading partners as well. The Khan was protected by a Muslim bodyguard of mercenaries from Khwarezm. In short, we have no good reason to believe that the Khazars had any hostility towards Islam. If we consider the idea that converting to Islam would mean alliance with the Caliphate, that's not really sustainable either. It's a long way from Biliar to Baghdad. Certainly, Al-Mish would not have been able to expect any military assistance against the Khazars. We also do not have any evidence that the Khazars took any action against the Bulgars connected to the conversion. Just as before, if the Bulgars paid their tribute, the Khazars stayed away. In the event, the Bulgars did not declare their independence until after Khazaria collapsed, a generation after the conversion to Islam. And until then, they did not really do anything to hurry the process along. So I think we can conclude that they did not convert for political reasons. The trade explanation is much more likely. Acknowledging the Caliph had no real-world impact on the rulers of Bulgaria. He was a long way away, and the Caliphs were already losing anything more than nominal control over their periphery by the 10th century. So the Caliph combined tremendous prestige from his role in Islam with the absence of any power to interfere with whatever Al-Mish or his successors were doing. Ibn Fadlan relates that Al-Mish was quite open about this dismissing any chance of the Caliphate moving against Bulgaria due to the 3,000 kilometers of distance between them, a gap filled with hostile steppe peoples. The continuous flow of merchants between the Caliphate and Bilia probably meant that Almish was reasonably well informed of the state of affairs in Baghdad and knew of the Caliph's declining authority. In actual fact, their main source of Muslim influence on the Volga was not Baghdad, but Khwarezm. The Bulgars adopted its Hanafi school of Sunni Islam, a more liberal branch that would be taken up by most of the Turkic-speaking peoples of Central Asia. The Hanafi school taught that belief in the teachings of Islam was more important than compliance with rituals and legal obligations, an attractive proposition for would-be converts. Closer religious and cultural alignment reinforced Khwarezm's place as the Bulgars' most favoured trading partner. The Arab geographer Ibn Holkal noted that they sent all of their most valuable furs to Khwarezm. Khwarezm sent back silver dirhams by the million, and commerce between Bulgar and Khwarezm became so extensive that trade directly with the central caliphate was abandoned. Khwarezmian missionaries also travelled with merchants to the Volga and recorded that they enjoyed great success among the steppe tribes. As we've noted a couple of times, in steppe cultures the leader did not force a religion on his followers. Conversions took place when they decided to put their seal of approval on processes that were already taking place. We do not know when the Bulgar elites began adopting Islam, but there must have been a substantial party already in favour for Al-Mish to decide to send his mission to Baghdad. If there was, as far as we can tell, it was a recent development. Ibn Fadlan, instructing Al-Mish in the correct Muslim practices, told him that he should proclaim his own name and the name of his father. But Al-Mush declined on the basis that his father was an unbeliever. He complained that he had an unbeliever's name and chose his new name of Jafar and the name of Abdullah for his father. From that point on, all the rulers of Bulgaria had Muslim names, so it does appear that he was the first to convert. 
While the Bulgars may have supported the change, it seems that other tribes might not have. Ibn Fadlan mentions the leader of the Askal rejecting Islam. Volga Bulgaria did become increasingly unified over its pre-Mongol history, in contrast to Rus. But the consolidation of a national identity was still in its early days under Almush. According to the Hudud al-Alam, a 10th century Persian geographical work of unknown authorship, quote, The tribes of Bulgaria are all at war with each other, but if an enemy appears, they become reconciled. Suva had considerable independence, and some scholars believe that the adoption of Islam resulted in an effective split between the Bulgars and Suvars for a couple of decades. Over the longer term, though, the adoption of Islam almost certainly promoted the central authority of Alwish and his successors, and the ongoing unification, especially as the variety of Turkic, Slavic and Finno-Ugrian peoples in his realm did not have any common religious or ideological basis for uniting in opposition, and Muslims most likely quickly became the largest single group. According to Ibn Fadlan, 5,000 Bulgars took part in the initial official conversion, a round number that's probably simply representative of a substantial crowd. There's no other evidence of mass conversion, although, as already noted, burial practices already showed that Islam was becoming widespread, and pagan-style burials rapidly decreased and disappeared entirely by the end of the 10th century. What Islam meant to the Bulgars at the time is another question. Many of the conversions were probably due to the missionaries travelling with the merchants, who did not settle or create schools. Islam did not have the trained institutional priesthood that the Christian church used to spread its practices. Ibn Fadlan reports that the Bulgars did not know the correct rules and rituals and needed scholars to teach them proper Islam. He was surprised, for example, to find that the Bulgars were using the name Muhammad for women. Although certain things met with his disapproval, this ignorance of or disregard for the formal rules was acceptable in Hanafi Islam. Despite this, we can see that Islam put down deep roots on the Volga, becoming a part of the identity of the Bulgars and their successors despite conquest and suppression that has survived to this day. Join me next episode as we return to Kiev for Sviatoslav, a Rus king who very nearly took Rus history in a very different direction. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>